I was on and I turned myself off. Did you hear me singing this morning? What? No. <laughs> yeah, makes me wonder. Well, it is good to see all of you this morning. What a great day, huh? I just remember two weeks ago walking over chunks of ice to get to church. It's gone. It's gone. Yes. Well, it's uh, the beginning of our week of missions, and uh, I'm honored to be able to share with you this morning. And if you want to turn in your Bibles, I'm going to read one verse of Scripture in Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Some of you probably know this by heart. Maybe you don't know that you memorized it, but it's a song that we used to sing way back in the day. Uh, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. And with my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness through all generations. That's the version of the song. I don't know what Bible translation that is. But in the New Living, it says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. And so today, as we kind of kick off the week of missions, I want to just challenge us to looking at the, the, the big picture and our part and what we play in this. It's really a privilege that we have to be part of missions, to be part of reaching uh, the world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. David, the, the writer of the psalm, felt compelled to proclaim God's goodness, his love, his, his mercy, and his faithfulness. And he was determined to declare it in such a way uh, that would touch every generation that would follow. He said, with my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness through all generations. So I want to proclaim the message, the faithfulness, the love, the mercy, the grace of God that will affect not just the world where I live right now, but for all generations to come. David felt obligated to share God's faithfulness. If he did so, how much more should we today? We who have experienced uh, uh, what Jesus Christ has done for us. The message of Jesus Christ is a transformation that's, that takes place in our lives. Who open our hearts and open our lives to his work. You see, Jesus came. God sent his son to take our place, to take our sin upon himself. And he took that sin to the cross and died in our place. That's the gospel message. How much more should we proclaim his faithfulness throughout the generations? That should be our heart's cry. That should be what we did. That's the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus is both cross-cultural and transgenerational. Those are some big words, but here's, this is really who we want to be as a, as a church, New Hope, and it really marks who we are. We, we are intentionally relational. You see, the gospel message is, it happens, and, it, and it's um, transferred through relationship. What God has done in us, we share with somebody else. We're witnesses of what he's done. We're witnesses of the transformation, of the change that can take place in a person's heart, in a person's life. How many of your life, you know, your life is obviously different than it was before you met Christ. Your life is a witness. Your life is a testimony. And every one of us who have received Jesus Christ, we have been called to be witnesses. Jesus said, you will go and be witnesses because we have experienced it. Now we take that message. That's the kind of church we want to be relational so that, so that this is transferred from person to person. If we don't connect with one another and, and, and know each other and be known by other people, how do we get that message across? So God has placed you intentionally in certain places in your, in your workplace. You're, you're not a, an electrician or a, a business person or a, an accountant or whatever you do. Uh, that's not primarily who you are. You are a child of Christ, and he has used that vehicle to put you in a, in a workplace where you can influence and, um, and take the gospel message where you're at. You are first and foremost a child of God. And so we take that message. It happens through relationships. We're a, a, a relational church. We're missions focused. That's the, really the heart of our church. And uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Weaver, I know you said this in the early service, but did you mention in, in this service that um, we as a church, New Hope, in 2018, uh, were 22nd in the nation of all 13,000 plus churches in the Assemblies of God in the United States number 22 in our overall world missions giving and so that is to be commended for that it's not that we try to try to 
earn a place or that just says this is our heart this is who we are we give because we see the need and i i want to commend you in that uh we're a missions focused church we're multi-generational we value all ages we're multi-ethnic we want to reach and connect people of all nationalities here in our community and around the world so that is our that is our heart's desire that's who we are that's what we want to be and even as the psalmist david declared his intention to make god's faithfulness known through all generations we face the same challenge of making sure that our generation is in step with god's plan and his purpose for our lives and that the gospel is passed on first to our families then to our neighbors to our co-workers to um, our nation and beyond the borders of of the united states of america to the whole world Last, last uh, quarter on Wednesday night, my, my Wednesday night bi- Bible class was, uh, we studied the book of Judges. I don't know how many of you have read or studied the book of Judges, but we're in John, the Gospel of John now, and it seems so much more inspiring than the book of Judges. Judges follows the book of Joshua, where in the book of Joshua, there were great exploits as, as they, um, uh, Joshua led the Israelites from, uh, in, into the promised land. And so in the book of Joshua, before the book of Judges, uh, we, we witnessed them crossing the Jordan River in a miraculous way. The waters were backed up, they took a step of faith, and they all crossed on dry ground. So amazing in a, in a, in a flood stage that they were able to do so. There was victory over Jericho. Uh, in Joshua, the sun stood still while Joshua and the Israelites uh, pursued the Amorites. Uh, there was the dividing of the land of all the tribes. And at the end of, of the book of Joshua, Uh, Joshua is encouraging them. He says, be strong and courageous. He was motivating and challenging them to stay connected with the Lord, to follow the Lord with all of their heart. He implores them to choose God over all the other gods that were in that nation and all the other endeavors that they could pursue. He's saying, stay with the Lord. And he, and he follows that up, and you'll know this scripture in, at the end of Joshua chapter 24 where he says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Determine in your heart that you are going to follow God no matter what, because there's a lot of other options out there. There's a lot of other things you can get involved in, and it's going to take your heart away from God. Stay in relationship with God. Follow God with all of your heart. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So what transpires in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 2, should motivate every generation that comes to to a time of action. Because after all these great exploits that we read in the book of Joshua, uh, we get to Judges chapter 2, and Joshua, the one who has led them through all of this, Joshua chapter 2, or Judges chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that Joshua died. I think he was 120 or 130 years old when he died. Verse 9 says that they buried him. He had an allotted amount of land just like everybody else did. They buried him there. But what happens in verse 10 is what should motivate us to action. Judges 2.10 says that after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he had done for Israel. One generation after Joshua died, they completely forgot God. How does that happen? You see, we can't do anything about generations past, but our obligation is to this generation. And not only to this generation, but as David said, I will make his faithfulness known through all generations. It starts with us. We have have to take ownership in that. If there's even a remote chance of generations after us to follow, we've got to take care of today. In Deuteronomy, before, before Joshua took charge, in Deuteronomy, before they crossed into the promised land, This is the instruction of the Lord in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. As they're getting ready to go into the promised land, he says, The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again and again with your children. Repeat them again and again and again. This should be who we are. That what is inside of us comes out, that we connect not only with our family, that is our first priority, and then it goes beyond that to the other sphere of influence that we have. But this should be who we are, that we proclaim God's faithfulness in all uh, the, the spheres of influence that we, that we are in. 
that we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God that changes lives, and he's changed you. It ought to come through you, and in our homes, they ought to be places where we are discipling our children, our grandchildren, and that ought to be the case at uh, at the far outreaches of our influences. We've got to be people of God and proclaim his faithfulness to the generations. If we're going to do so, then this is, uh, this is the first thing that I see. Uh, we need to be a generation that is aware. We need to be aware of our orders. And it was Jesus that gave us this command before he left the earth. Verse, uh, chapter, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. This is the great commission. Our missionary yesterday morning in the men's breakfast uh, referred to it as the co-mission. It's us together. We've carried this mission of the Lord to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we are to proclaim his faithfulness. We are to take that gospel message wherever we go. The, The great commission is not an option. It's a command of the Lord to all who have experienced a relationship with Christ, who are following him, we're called to go. Not only aware of our orders, but aware of the opportunities. You see, there are opportunities all around us. And we, you can read stories in the Bible. There are stories of, of, of despair. There are stories of depravity. Uh, and, and so many of those stories end with victory. We sang this morning songs about God being our victory, what Jesus has done in our life to save us, to set us free from the penalty of our sins. We live with hope. We live with purpose. God has worked victory in our life. It's what Jesus did on the cross that makes me who I am. Are you thankful that someone died in your place so that you could live, so that you could have the hope of life, not only here, but in eternal life to come? That's what we, that's the message that we carry. And there are opportunities. We see throughout Scripture that God values people. We're His creation. We're, we're the prized possession of all of His creation people. And, and Scripture tells us that He loved us so much that He sent Jesus to die for us so that we could live for Him and so that someday we would live with Him. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that's the message. He said, go and make disciples. Are you hearing his voice today? Are you hearing the message today to go make disciples? Are you being obedient to that command? Go means to allow him to use you to advance his kingdom. And he hasn't given you that mission for you to do on your own. Acts 1.8, before Jesus ascended to heaven, Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be witnesses, first in Jerusalem, Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It begins here and goes out, but it's the Holy Spirit in us that empowers us to be the witnesses that he's called us to be. It starts at home, and it works its way to the ends of the earth. We need to be aware of our orders. We need to be aware of the opportunities and aware of opposition. You see, we're naive if we think that um, Satan's just going to give up and give in when we, when we pursue this mission of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. You see, he's all about instigating and stirring up trouble to divert and distract the mission. And when difficulties arise, those who are not aware, the unaware, are going to lose heart. So we need to be aware. In Jeremiah 12, 5, it says, If racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? If you stumble and fall on open ground, what will you do in the thickest near the Jordan? He's saying, what match are you? We've got to realize that there is an opposition, and we're up against opposition that's serious business. But I'm thankful that he hasn't called us to take that mission on against the enemy by ourselves, because the Bible tells us that greater is he that's in us than the one that's in the world. 
It's his power in us. He's already overcome the enemy. We need his power. We need his Holy Spirit to fill us and to anoint us and and to send us out. So when those difficulties arise, if we're not aware, we're going to lose heart. Contrast that with what Jesus said in the Great Commission. He said, be sure of this, I am with you always. I will always be with you to the very end. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16, Paul says, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. You might be in a situation that seems enormous and overwhelming to be discouraged and feel like what's the use what's the point feel like giving up feel like quitting you've been on mission and you've just gotten distracted and you're sitting on the sidelines the reality is is we're up against a foe who is serious business but paul's saying we don't give up and he's saying look those those situations and circumstances that you're in they seem overwhelming, they seem like a mountain, they seem so big, but he, he called them light and momentary troubles. In the big picture of things, I always like to, to it, this just seems to be the way that I look at life. Step back, take a look at the big picture. Step back and look at your circumstances or look at your situation, look at your mission, the mission that God has you on. Step back and take a look at the big picture because so oftentimes we're in this battle and we think it's just us and it's up to us and we're doing it ourselves. When the reality is God didn't send us on mission to do it by ourselves. He's saying, look, I am in this co-mission with you. I'm giving you my Holy Spirit so that you will go and be witnesses You need to see that I'm at work in your life. And so in that big picture perspective, those mountains of problems, the the difficulty that it is for us to, uh, sometimes we bump up against in this mission to take the gospel wherever we go, it it seems overwhelming. But in the big picture reality of things, it's, it's it's small beans. Because God is greater. For our light and present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now are soon gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. We've got to have an eternal outlook, an eternal view of life and our mission. We need to live for eternal things. What Pastor Weaver says, the things that money can't buy and that death can't take away. We need to be a generation that's aware. We also need to be a generation that cares. Problem is, is we live in a, in a culture, in a society, in a generation of growing insensitivity. We're becoming desensitized to a lot of, a lot of stuff. The things that we see on TV, the things that we see going on around the world, the um, shootings where multiple people are, 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 are killed. The uh, natural disasters that are happening where lives are taken out and we see so much of it anymore that we just become desensitized. We can see hungry, starving people. We can see lost people. But we, if, we, if we don't, uh, if we don't uh, care, if we, real, if we don't realize that we're becoming more desensitized, we're becoming insensitive, we'll get to a place where we say, we just don't care that much. Maybe we won't say that, but that's really what it is. We're a generation that just doesn't care. I mean, we've got our own lives to deal with, right? That's their problem. Or we just don't see because we've become desensitized. It's like the the proverbial phrase, you can't see the forest because of the trees. We get so used to seeing it that we don't see anything. We think that there's got to be some other way. Somebody else will do it. Someone else will go. Someone else will tell them. But the real question is this. Do we have the heart of God? Do you have the heart of God? to see what he sees and to care about what he cares about, to do what he does. Matthew 9, 36 tells us about Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. God's heart breaks for people, does does ours. Acts 13, 22, God says, I've found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. See, the scripture tells us in 1 Samuel about this calling of David to be king. It says, what, what man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God knows our heart. Where is our heart? Do we care? 
and if we've become part of the, the, the desensitization that's going on around us, we need to step back again and say, God, break my heart for what your heart breaks for. Let me care about what you care for. And do we care enough even at that point to obey? Are we willing to arrange, rearrange our priorities and be obedient to God's call? And I heard some oohs when Pastor Weaver said, what if, we, what if we gave as much to missions as we spent on our vacation? But what if? Are we obedient to what God calls us to? Be a generation that's aware, a generation that cares, and thirdly, a generation that shares. We have another issue to face and deal with, and that is uh, materialism and greed, which is a part of our culture that we live in. And we can buy into this philosophy or mentality that I, I'm owed this, or that I got to have this or that because that's what so and so. And there's just this standard or way of doing things, and we lose sight of the of the big picture. How much of the values of the world that we live in? How much have they impacted us? What does God value? God values people. Do we? Romans 12, 2 tells us, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. I want God to change the way that I think so that I think like he thinks. I care about what he cares about. My heart breaks for what his heart breaks for. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, the culture that you live in, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Francis Chan is quoted as saying this. He says, the world says, love yourself, grab all you can, and follow your heart. God says, deny yourself, grab your cross, and follow him two very different things. Which path are you on? See, the solution to all of this is to be a giver. And I'm not just talking about money, but our time, our resources, everything that God has blessed us with to realize it's all from Him and I need to use it for Him. We're challenged with these three simple things when it comes to missions and being a a missions-minded, missions-hearted people. And the first is to pray. Pray. I hope that you have private time in your life where you are alone with God to pray. And some of you say, well, I, I just don't know what to pray for or pray about. I, I just opened up my drawer, and these are a few of the uh, prayer cards that I've picked up from missionaries over just the past year or so. I probably have about 20 of them here. And every missionary that comes has a card. And what if you just took those cards and what if your prayer time was simply just calling these guys, these couples' names out in prayer and saying, God, would you go before them? Would you surround them and protect them? Keep them, keep their heart, keep their mission, keep them on focus. God, would you protect them? And if you were just to name them one by one, man, you, you can go through five minutes in no time. And then our heart is onto other people and onto the big mission, onto the big plan. Uh, so these cards, great. In, in prayer, we learn to listen to God. And as we listen, we realize that God is speaking to us. And if we're listening to what he's saying, uh, re the reality is God wants to use you. God wants to work through you. There are moments and opportunities that you have all throughout your day, and you're on mission where you're at. No, you're not a missionary that's called to go to another land, but you're a witness right where you're at. And so if, if, you're, if you're connecting with the Lord and his heart's for people, your heart is for people, and you'll start seeing the people at work, not as people to avoid or stay away from, but there's people that need the Lord. And so I'm a light. Maybe you're the only light in your workplace. Maybe you're the only light in your family. And God has called you to, to, to be right where you're at. Uh, Pastor Kerry mentioned just, just a few minutes ago about the, uh, about the small group prayer bands. And I encourage you to... to um, Take part in that if that just connects with you. Uh, what an amazing thing to have teams of people um, to pray for those missionaries in those very dark places. One of the quotes I just wrote down as the video was playing, things happen when we pray that wouldn't happen if we didn't. Sometimes we 
pretty quick and easy to pass off the opportunity to pray. Not only to pray, but give. And I ask this question, do you give God your best? A few weeks ago, actually back in January, I preached the message as we were uh, talking about really um, wanting more of God, more of his presence in our lives. And, and uh, I made the statement that God should never get our leftovers. God desires and wants and deserves our best. And I asked this question, and I, and I know it's the heart of every parent to say, I love my kids so much that there's nothing that I wouldn't do for them. There's nothing that I wouldn't give them. That is, that is a heart of a parent toward their children. But do we have that same heart for God? That we could say, God, I love you so much that there's nothing that I wouldn't do for you. There's nothing that I wouldn't give you. That's revolutionary. We ought to love God first, and it's his love that helps us to uh, love our children. But the question again is, does our heart beat the same for God? You see, when it comes to giving, um, tithe comes first. It's, it's a tenth. It's simply a tenth. It doesn't mean anything more than the first tenth of your income belongs to God. And I would challenge you that if you're not tithing, to start doing so. And if you say, I can't afford to do that, again, take a step back. Look at the big picture. Look at your finances and say, you know, what, what is it that's keeping me from being able to give God the first, the tenth, and not just giving him whatever is left over at the end? Maybe, maybe satellite TV, which is something that we got rid of here at the beginning of the year, just looking at it going, you know, how much are we spending on That's an easy way where we can save some money. It changes our lifestyle a little bit, but maybe that's for the best too. I, I, I just say, let's listen to the Holy Spirit and say, God, we want you to be first and not just be our words, but be our action. Malachi, Malachi challenges, he says, you know, what he's saying is there are people that are robbing God. And they're saying, how do we do that? And his answer was in tithes and offerings. They were keeping God's portion and just giving him their token leftovers. You say you can't afford to tithe, and I think the response is you can't afford not to. It's an act of obedience to God, tithing, giving. If we're spending beyond our means, then we've got to back up and reprioritize. God gets the first tenth of all that we have. And, and the reason I say that is because I think if we're not doing that, we're missing a blessing. And you read in Malachi chapter 3, and, and, and it's God's words. He says, put me to the test. Try it. Try it and see. Put me to the test. If you do, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it all in. How many of you would like to be in that place? to say, God, I, and we're not tithing to get blessing. We're just, but he's saying, this is the way it was meant to be. Just do, just do it the way it was meant to be. So our priorities are right, and our, our focus is right, and we're on the mission and the task of pursuing what God's heart is all about. So after, you, after you've made this decision to tithe, then we encourage you to give to missions. Uh, and we're making faith promises. There's cards in the floor you can pick up if you're not going to be here next week. Consider what God might have you to do for missions. That's above and beyond the tent, right? So what has God placed on your heart? And there, some of you, obviously, you know, we haven't, we haven't become the missions giving church that we have without people who have a heart for this. So, you know, I, I realize in a, in a large way I'm speaking to the choir, but my guess is not all of us are doing that. And just, just think about this, you know, if we would just do what God asked us to do, even if it was a dollar a week. If we were all to do a dollar a week more than what we're doing right now, there may be, I know that there's over a thousand people, probably 1,200 people here in the sanctuary in both services today. If, if each person were to give one dollar a week, that's $52 in a year. That, a, a dollar is easy come, easy go anymore, Right? It's kind of like when my parents used to give me a nickel to go buy a sucker or a penny to go buy a sucker. I mean, big deal. It's just loose change. A dollar has become like loose change. But if we all put a dollar together over the course of a year, we'd have over $70,000. And if we would challenge ourselves to think, okay, pastor, you know, if we, if we give up a meal or we give up a coffee, a coffee, some of you pay easily $5 for a coffee. And I don't know how many days a week that you do that. I, I do the brood kind and I spend enough money on that. Um, brewing it at home but listen at five dollars just giving up a coffee or a couple sodas and a candy bar a week and if we all did that we're talking over four hundred thousand dollars just from doing five dollars a person extra this year above what we're doing right now 
I say just listen to God's heart and say, what God, what do you want me to give? And then be obedient. It's a, it's a faith promise. Nobody's going to call you up and say, hey, you promised to give this. That's be- completely between you and God. And we ask you to fill out those forms, and we don't even ask you to give them to us. We're not tallying all that. That's between you and God. And maybe God's stretching you. Maybe you say, God, I want you to stretch me a little bit. And it's not like, you know, there's going to be a hammer that hits you in the head if you don't reach that. But the idea is, God, what can you enable me to do with you and I working together? And I know that when we pursue the heart of God and we start doing things the way that he wants us to, he's going to bless us. That's what he promises us to do in, his, in, in the word. Not only are we 22nd in the nation in overall world missions giving, second in, in speed the light giving, almost a quarter of a, over a quarter of a million dollars to speed the light, our youth missions giving, and fifth in the nation in BGMC. So your heart is for missions in and uh, I appreciate that. I just say, God, what do you want us to do above and beyond? Because the, the mission is still there. It hasn't changed. Not only do we pray and give, but we go. We encourage everyone, if you can, to go on a mission trip. How many of you have been on a mission trip before? Maybe it's somewhere to an inner city or somewhere here in the, in the States or overseas, wherever it might be. 18 years plus of being in youth ministry, I took a lot of missions trips, took a lot of students and it easy, easily I can say that the vast majority of those that I took on missions trips are still connected in a relationship with the Lord today and in church serving God today. It does something. That experience affects you in a positive way. And I'd encourage you uh, to, to, to do that. It's not just for young people. It's not just for, for students. It's for all ages. We want to be known not only as a church that gives to missions, but a church that sends. And so just, just listen and if you could at all possible do a mission trip, I'd encourage you to do so. And if you're thinking I'm too old to consider being a missionary, I want to close with this story. A story that I read this week about a 60-year-old widow that had contacted the Assemblies of God World Missions uh, to express her interest in becoming a missionary. She was told that she would need more schooling. So she went at 60 and enrolled in a Bible college and, and graduated with a four-year degree. Once again, she contacted the AGWM and was told that there was nothing available at the moment, so she decided to go and roll in seminary. So she went to the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary to get her master's degree in Greek. And um, when she was finished with that degree, she contacted the World Missions again, and she was told that a Greek teacher was urgently needed at the Theological Seminary in Kiev, Ukraine. And so at the age of 67, she departed for the mission field to fulfill the call that God had placed on her heart at the age of 67 to go teach Greek in a Russian-speaking country. Isn't that amazing? Just being open and available to what God would call us to do. I mean, the reality is God, God I believe, could and wants to call some of you, many of you, to some mission somewhere. If we're not listening and our heart's not open, we can't hear There's no better place to be than where God is in the center of our life and we're following his call. Whether you're a witness where you're at or you're a called missionary and sent somewhere else, let our hearts be open to give, to pray, and to go. Would you bow your heads with me? morning you hear me talk about missions about praying and giving and going but if you're saying this morning pastor jeff i'm i'm one of those that needs to open my heart to the message of jesus christ and you'd say this morning you're, you're hearing this but you're realizing i need i need to open my heart and life to jesus i need him to save me and forgive me of my sins I need this hope, I need the salvation, I need the peace that I'm in this life and in this world for a purpose and it's God's mission, it's God's plan. And today you just say, I, the Holy Spirit is speaking and I'm responding and I wanna give my life to Jesus. With every head bowed and your eye closed, would, if that's you, would you just raise a hand? There are people in the room, you need to open your life to Jesus and invite him in to save, save you from your sins. Thank you, thank you. Just keep it up if you are looking around the room. God's mission is for everyone. He's not willing that any perish. Several of you this morning that have your hands raised, would you just join me in a prayer and in your own words with your own heart, just speak words out to him like, Jesus, 
I open my heart and my life to you and I invite you to come in. Come into my life and save me. Save me from my sins. Jesus, I thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for loving me and dying in my place and taking my punishment, my sin upon yourself so that I could be free from you. Jesus, save me and put me on mission. Jesus, thank you for giving peace and, and purpose and, and uh, hope, freedom, freedom from my sin. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. Come in and change me. In Jesus' name.